Good morning. So we, uh, we want to share with you our technology choices journey from the REI Distribution Center. My name is Bill Best. I'm the Divisional Vice President. Uh, I am responsible for supply chain operations, so the three distribution centers. Uh, we're fortunate to have a couple of our partners joining uh, Rick and I today. Um, so we're going to go through introductions. We want to show you a short video because it can kind of give you the visualization of what the flow of the facility hey, is. And then we'll do some deep dives. So, Chris? Good morning. I'm Chris Castaldi. I'm the Vice President of Sales for DMWNH. Uh, DMWNH was the systems integrator partnering with CNAP and some other subcontractors, suppliers that did the project. This is active? It is. My name is Rudy. I'm with uh, CNAP, and we provided for the system the one-touch Omni fulfillment system, what you guys will learn a little bit more later on. Hello, I'm uh, Rick Bingle, Vice President of Supply Chain at REI, and um, we look forward to watching uh, this video with you and doing um, a condensed presentation and then allow opportunity for each of you to ask questions. REI was started in 1938 as a co-op. We live based on a mission and a purpose. We believe that a life outdoors is a life well lived. Everything that you see here in the warehouse is all about helping you experience the outdoors. When we brought the team of partners together, be it Merritt, Butler, Renaissance, Canap, and DMWNH, we set some very clear design expectations. We said that we wanted to build the brand of REI into this facility. We said that we wanted to bring the culture of how we treat employees into this building. We said that we wanted to create the most sustainable building ever built, energy net neutral, lead platinum. We also said that we wanted to create a technology system and solution that no one had seen before. It's DMWNH and Canap working together that found that solution for this facility. There's been a long history between REI and DMWNH, and the relationship that's been built over time has established some trust that we're able to challenge each other a little bit differently than we are entering into a brand new relationship and trying to figure out what is the right way to engage. That was really critical in our ability to deliver game-changing technology and challenge what would be a more traditional approach to building the distribution facility as compared to what we've done with this omni-channel distribution facility. So we've had a relationship with DMWNH for over 10 years. Chris Castaldi, one of their uh, team members, has been an amazing partner to really look at REI, listen to REI, understand what our objectives were, and then create solutions that allowed us to facilitate our mission, our purpose for our members. REI and DMWNH have had a long relationship. When REI started talking about its third distribution center in the Southwest, Rick Bingle asked me to look at some ideas. And he threw out what I thought was a standard approach. And I looked at Chris and I said, we can do better. Go out and search for better. And Chris did. I ended up traveling around the world, including Europe, and found unique technologies that hadn't been done before in the United States. The key was the pocket sorter and marrying it with the shuttle OSR from Canap. And sure enough, we built this building. The best of what DMWNH could create as an integrator and the best of what Canap could build from their OSR and pocket sorter. All right, love it when the slides work. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of the flow and the uh, visuals of the facility. One of the things that I want to make sure that we give some opportunity to is to talk a little bit about there were things that we chose to go after investment-wise, but there are also things that we were already, already doing well and would declare that some of these things were best-in-class solutions. So Rick, could you frame for us a little bit about what were those things that were already doing well in the other facilities so we start narrowing into the technology investment? Well, I think the real conversation that we want to have is about this, you know, omni-channel goods-to-person station. But I want everyone to understand that all of this builds off of sort of inbounding of products. So we inbound off of GS1-128 barcode. Uh, it's automated receiving. Um, those cartons are immediately destined either to deep reserve put away or cross-docking out to a store or to the OSR itself to be decanted and put away. Um, so about 60% of our product basically flows that way. The other 40% at REI, you probably know, we sell kayaks and boats and really big things that are non-conveyable. 
So the non-conveyable aspects aren't there, but everything builds off of a, uh, a general ASN and inbound. And if you were to look at our outbound processes, again, sortation across all modes of parcel carriers, and of course, sortation out to our stores, LTL palletization and, uh, and out there. But the real heart of this is, what are we doing after we've brought the product into the OSR and how it flows from there? Right, so the handling of each touches within our production environment begins at the process where we take it out of the plain cardboard and we're moving it into totes. And before we get there, you have to know what the business rules are that uh, drive the activity within that system. Rudy, could you talk to us a little bit about the business rules, how that um, integrates back into the systems integration, and we'll kind of touch some of that software component. Uh, my nature is really software. That's what I did do for 20 years. And um, so working with uh, Chris, this guy with Bill, with, with uh, Rick, I learned uh, what their business is and the requirements for their stores. Their stores are pretty large. I hope that you guys went there at some point. And uh, so we just don't want to deliver another laundry basket and then the associates in the store need to figure out where the stuff goes. So we made it store ready, aisle ready. So there was a lot of prioritization. We call this packing groups. We call this, um, you know, whatever it belongs in, in one aisle of a store. So understanding those business rules, uh, we implemented the Shiraz, that's the WCS from DMWNH. Oh no, it's a crazy acronym, so I totally get that. So there's a WMS that has the business rule. There's a WCS from WNH. And uh, they, do, they don't know much about business, but they know how to get a product from A to B. And then there's the picking engine, that's the knap system with the OSR and the pocket sorter. So that's a traditional approach to do a correct WMS, WCS implementation. We use every system where it's very good at. I know it's a lot of information. I'll be here when the show is over. I'm glad to answer some questions. So I think one of the key additions in that was that sizing and scope of how we looked at this project. And as you know, we early on developed with um, Bill and Rick in figuring out the size and understanding the business, which Rudy spoke to just now. It was the whole thing of learning somebody's businesses and learning what really mattered to them, what made REI different. The fact they have kayaks, they have bicycles, they had certain requirements to fulfill the store, that stores are not mirror cookie cutter stores. They're all very unique. They're all special in just their architectural design, and we needed to maintain that. And they also have huge peaks and valleys in their sales cycle. Um, and really didn't understand that. We needed to learn a lot about that and sort of develop some part of that and go through that. So it was that learning process that we didn't design a system that was completely to handle the peak, which is that big sale week that we needed to balance that out, have a, a solution to deal with it, but have a way to keep efficiencies through the whole system and that part and make the equipment that we chose utilize very highly. Thanks, Chris. A couple of, uh, a couple of notes uh, relative to the learning and understanding the business. We run about 75,000 SKUs, uh, and we have about 120,000 totes within our ASRS system. Uh, so that math isn't one for one. Uh, you can understand that. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But the 120,000 is our answer to how do you not build the church for Easter Sunday, right? Um, build to the right amount of flex capacity and afford the system and processes to find paths to deal with the peaks during those weeks that were in the peak uh, arrangement. And for us, that's about six weeks out of every year. So again, the investment component of that uh, is, is somewhat intuitive. I think the other, uh, the other challenge then became how do you take what is very complex from uh, analysis, scaling, uh, modeling of the business, understanding the business rules, applying those, expecting outcomes that deliver against consistency and reliability as we as operators have an obligation to all of our companies to serve? So from, a, from uh, the point now that we get to where we're taking uh, units out of cardboard and we're moving them into uh, totes for induction into the OSR system, Rick, why don't you explain some of the simple simplicity of that process, uh, but the urgency and uh, the compelling argument for it, the accuracy needs. So, you know, this all comes back to scanning, and we 
all of us are asking the question, how many times do I have to scan a product to ensure quality accuracy on the outbound side? And as we looked at this technology and, you know, I think we were all in a car talking about it at one point, and we said, can we get rid of scanning? But we knew that we had to have one key scan that we could trust, and that was at what we call decant, which, what is decant? As we receive a carton via ASN, automated, we throw it on a conveyor, it travels, it gets received via, you know, being scanned, and it immediately goes to a decant station. Now, in simple terms, all we're going to do is take the product out of the cardboard box, we're going to put it into a tote, and the tote will be injected into the OSR and be held until there's demand. But that's where we get the accuracy play right there. We take out a hand scanner, we scan the UCC 128 barcode one more time. Now we know exactly what should be in that product, but we also make the user pull a product out, scan the UPC. We also show the user a picture. We also ask the user to do a count of the number of units, but it is a blind count. Since the UCC 128, the ASN told us there's 12 in the box, they enter 12, now we basically have a match between what our receiving said, what our person sees, the count, and it goes into the tote. Now what's nice about this is, is that we have now injected a highly accurate uh, product and count into the OSR. And as we talk more about how the OSR brings product out and how accurate it is and how it sorts, we don't do any more scanning. We don't scan any of our splits to our stores. We don't scan any of our splits that are going to our direct to customer. We don't scan it at packaging. We don't need to. And the accuracy that we're seeing is higher than our other two buildings where we scan everything on the outbound. I think one of the keys that came in designing the station was that when we looked at the early tenants and rules, and you see it in the entry of the video, how important associates are to REI and how much. So the design of that station was key in finding key ergonomics. The way it came in, the way that the case came in, the location to drop it in the tote, the amount of turning was all key in that, that it was minimized and it was an ergonomic. You can see here on the picture the, uh, the, that it's a coat, it matches, they've scanned it, and all that simple track. And just above it is a simple, they th toss up the, uh, the uh, recyclable cart, uh, case and it's sent out to recycling there. So it's a definitely an efficient way to do it and ergonomic and then gets your high speed productivity at it. So 10 people are able to do all this work, which would take usually a lot more. So when we were designing these workstations, and this will go through for the goods to person station as well, one of the things that we failed to mention in a conversation yesterday about people was that uh, we engaged with the National Organization for Disabilities. We wanted to learn how we could take some of these roles uh, and reach into people with special needs and disabilities and employ them within our distribution center. And now, while we're on our early parts of that journey, uh, we do have several folks within the facility, and the technology is both engaging for those without disability, uh, yet it's also capable to uh, enable folks with disability to work within the facility. Now, Rick, that being said, um, we get to the drum roll of what, what the heck, what does one-touch distribution or omni-channel production mean? Maybe you can explain a little bit about the activities that happen at this goods to person station. So this is really where the magic happens. So I want you to imagine that we've done decanting and we've put product into the OSR. It's a single inventory um, for REI. So we don't have a separated inventory for retail and a separated inventory for direct to consumer. It's all sitting in the OSR. As demand comes through, whether that demand is for retail or direct to consumer, it's gonna come to this station. And what you can see in this station where the two sort of uh, you know, video screens are, these are the donor totes that are coming in. So this came out of the OSR and it's product. And it's gonna tell the user by picture what the product is. It's gonna tell them how many they need to move. It's gonna go from uh, green to red. So it's gonna tell them pull out product color wise, pull it out. It'll tell them where these cardboard boxes are, what to put it in. If they put it in the wrong cardboard box, just by our hand coming through, it breaks a photo eye and it says you failed to do your job the right way and it stops the system. On the other hand, if you broke the correct photo eye, it says you did your job well. 
and you have now completed a retail pick. So the donor tote was here, you pulled out, you put it in the right cardboard box. When those cardboard boxes are full, they will automatically eject, an assembled cardboard box will come in. Now, the ejected cardboard box will go to an automated litter, it'll lid, it will go to an automatic print and apply, and it will go down to shipping. So if you think about what's happening here in this production environment, we're not going out to a deep reserve and doing a pick, we're not going to a put to light and doing a production, it's one touch from one inventory right here. Now, Bill, I wasn't sure. Oh, you can't see the pocket sorter in the back. In the back, you also see the pocket sorter. What you don't see with this gentleman is along his left side is where his pocket sorter is coming in. So while you were doing that retail pick out of this donor tote, if there was also demand for direct-to-consumer, the individual would have pulled the product out and put it in what is that white pocket in the background there. One unit per pocket and that pocket will disappear. If a customer ordered five of the same items, we'll put one unit in each pocket five times. On the other hand, I could have multiple customers in need of that product, and I may load up five pockets. Now what happens when the pockets leave? One of two things. If it is a single unit, single line order, it immediately goes to packaging, just disappears. On the other hand, if it is a multi-line order, it's going to go into the buffer system and as it goes into the buffer system, it'll resort itself in a way by which it brings your order and all your unique items side by side. And then it will go down to uh, our packaging. And so the magic here, the idea of omni-channel one-touch production is one inventory, one station, one pick for direct-to-consumer or retail and no other involvement in it uh, at any time. And no scanning. Sorry, that was against the script, right? <laughs> exactly. And Rudy, maybe you could also t uh, tie back a little bit on the software side of things. Some of the things that I have to direct here. So uh, we talked earlier that we organize things based on departments within the store so that we can help enable the in-store logistics, right? You want your retail folks facing a customer, not a cardboard box doing replenishing. So how do we accelerate that? Well, if you bring that all the way back into the distribution center, the goods to person station, you have to understand how, how do you pack and keep packing um, during the day? How do you know how many stations to be open uh, at any given time? Um, because you don't want to drive into starvation of, of any of the system. It needs to be working. So maybe you can explain a couple of those concepts. We had one particular hurdle with starvation and a little bit about how we overcame that. So we, I, I explained earlier a little bit about the business rules, what REI has, how to get the product to the stores. Again, we don't want to just send five different cartons and the product is all over the place and then the associates in the store need to run from one corner to the other just to empty one, one box. So that requires some sequencing. And we found a sweet, a, a sweet spot by not adding too much equipment to it, but enough sequencing, so it is store friendly. So those are the software rules, and that was a combination that, that the software was in, it was tested well, and then we needed to learn what the real business is of uh, REI, so we went through that uh, exercise a little bit, and understand how the various stores, because a store is not a store. Every store was, uh, had different demands and different uh, uh, prioritization and sequencing. So that's where we had at the beginning some opportunities to, I'm in sales, I say opportunities, it's a challenge. And um, so how to get that sequencing right. So yes, at the very be beginning, we had uh, to learn into the business, into the equipment, into this first omni-channel fulfillment system, highly automated. And uh, we, over we overcame those uh, learning curves fairly quickly. And... Um, What's the other point I tried to make then? Um, I got a little bit lost here. Maybe you can help me, Bill. Well, maybe, maybe what I can help you out with a little bit is um, relative to the workstations, um, we found out that we were imposing some crimes against uh, the starvation and driving some of that from the way that we were dropping our waves in. We had hoped that we could do continuous waves. And early That's on, right. we learned that continuous waves was really disruptive to the sequencing and therefore the utilization of the goods to person station. So getting that prioritization and understanding your wave logic 
what we found is that our opportunity was for continuous waves relative to our online picking because those interweave very well with our retail picking and was not disruptive. But when you tried to do the bulk picking in, a, um, in more waves, it was really disruptive to the system. So Rudy, I think that's our crime against CANAP that you helped uh, help bring our attention uh, to and helped to uh, resolve some of the starvation. So let me drive home there a few points. Uh, thank, thank you, Bill, for getting me back on the horse here. So what I want you to understand is that from the software architecture, it is a wave-based system, like what you do traditional with every WMS, wave picking and so on and so forth. We don't do anything different, except it is automated in a way that for the operations, for the user and for the supervisor, it is a waveless system. So there's no wave transition or anything like that. They're not even aware of what wave is currently active. So that's a seamless wave-based operation from the operational pros perspective. I think that's a very important case. And again, I would like to drive home that with this Omni station, the user is grabbing an item, putting this into a cardboard box. If it's retail, he doesn't really know, but that's what it is. Or he gets directed to induct this to the pocket sorter. So there's no scanning. Because we did all the QA and all the accuracy, we did do this upstream at receiving. So when we are under a time crunch to get this uh, order fulfilled fairly quickly, there's no further scanning and the performance is tremendous. I'm going to touch real quick and tee up Chris on, uh, on the scale part of the conversation because Chris's team did uh, the engineering to help us with scale. But imagine in this system, you already know that in an ASRS environment, you're not walking aisles with carts, right? You're not doing that picking. Uh, then you're not doing a put wall uh, as well. All of that activity is happening in this station. And so the engineering of it from a headcount perspective said we needed 70 less people in the distribution center. And it also afforded us to do, this, uh, to do our picking same day, which is about 12 hours faster than we've been able to do it manually for our other stores. But Chris, help us a little bit with how we reach the scale and number of the, of the uh, goods to person stations. It started when we you know, looked at the volume that was going to be done in a day, and it came back and compared it to the performance of the OSR and the number of totes they could deliver. And ultimately, we said, we need your people to perform and do a pick every six seconds. And everybody at REI said, that seems ex excessive. But today, when they need to, there are people who can outperform the machine they run faster. You sit there and you watch and you're like, you don't need to work this fast. They work at that station so efficiently that that design gets that. So ultimately, eight people touch what's going out to all the stores, all the direct-to-consumer are all handled, all those single picks, which is a huge volume and capacity on it. And when it was capable, it was in there, it was in the realm of reality, and that design was really... Uh, the key of looking and saying, what's the, the balance of the capability of the people and the capability of the equipment to achieve the goal? Bill, if I can add, you touched on ROI. I want you to think about what we didn't build. Um, we didn't build about 25,000 square feet of a building. We didn't build a mezzanine. We didn't build a put-to-light wall that could run eight pack groups at the same time for our stores. When you're really ROIing this, you have to recognize it through all of that lens, that this will actually allow you to build a smaller building, and that you won't build things like mezzanines and conveyors to a mezzanine, and that you won't build something like a put-to-light uh, wall, and that when you're done, you'll watch your entire operation be completed by eight people. It's pretty amazing. So certainly we could have built more and gone faster, but with eight people, what we're seeing is we've hit... Uh, we've hit hours where we'll get 10,000 uh, units touched and uh, sorted in one hour with eight people, uh, which is a pretty darn good. And the idea wasn't necessarily that everything had to be done within one hour. So when we do get to flex up to those, uh, to those types of numbers, it's cool to capture the, capture the math around it. Uh, but it's also important that you'll need to learn a very disciplined production environment capability because you need to be monitoring how, how fast are you doing this process and how fast are you passing the constraint to the next, to the next process. I want to shift just a little bit uh, and speak to um, what happens, as Rick was calling out, when I put something into a pocket 
There's a one-to-one -one relationship with that pocket. That pocket is RFID tagged, so the item remains discrete. That's what enables the system to do the sorting in the next steps of the process. So, so Rudy, maybe you can explain uh, just a little bit more detail about how the pocket sorter takes the items. I think it's pretty clear if it's a single item, it's going to move it down to a buffer for fulfillment. But talk about this smoke and mirrors and wizardry that happens that uh, brings an item that Rick picked at his station, and I picked one at my station 10 minutes later, and then Rudy came along with his third item for my order, and how did you have all that disparity come together to deliver it to a station for fulfillment? It's my favorite question, and I have to be honest, I don't really know how to answer that. I'm an engineer. I would love to educate you guys about hanging conveyor technology, RFID base, with a fully automated matrix sortation in two levels. I guess I lost you by now. Uh, Rick helped me out with that yesterday. He said, look, imagine a pile of cards, and they're all jumbled and mumbled and mixed up, and this machine is able to take all those cards and sequence them in the right order. So at the end of the day, think about this pocket sorter, not as a sorter, think about it, that is a sequencer. It's a sequencer, you're filling five, for example, 5,000 bags, this pouch, with one item. Every pouch has an RFID, so from that point on, we are not tracking the item, we are tracking this RFID, what is associated to the item. So we fill up this buffer, when we have the buffer with 5,000 items, average order line is 2.5 items per order. So we have like 2,000 orders roughly in that buffer. And then when we sort it down, fully automated, it's a two-level sortation. And what that allows us, the outcome, is a perfect sequence of all those pockets. That means the first three items, for example, is order one. The next two items is order two. That's how that works. So now, those first three items, they get to a pack station, and the packer gets presented exactly three bags, three pockets, three pouches. That means his order he has to pack has three items. So the quality check at that point is simply, if an item is in that very bag, then the accuracy is 100%. And I keep asking REI, this pocket sorter is a direct-to-consumer fulfilling engine. Tell me what the accuracy is. Did we made an error yet? And I'm getting weak answers. We're, uh, we're very pleased. And in fact, where we find our error coming out of this new building is where we do our non-conveyable uh, production. And, uh, and that has more scans built in it than, uh, than this does. So um, highly accurate, no scan process, and uh, we're real pleased. So I'm going to help out the folks that uh, are used to doing these types of conversations in CRANs because that's where I needed to start to understand the technology a bit. Uh, this, this really employs three processes that can run simultaneously to enable this to happen. First, you're picking and you're doing some accumulation of a batch of orders. There's a batch of orders that is in the process that Rudy just described. And then there's also a batch of orders that are in queue for the, uh, for the fulfillment activities. So you see how you can kind of disaggregate that. You can run multiple waves within there and you can keep all of the processes working at the same time. So now, we, now we're gonna get down to the fulfillment activities. And like I described earlier, we have both our single, uh, single item uh, or one pocket um, orders going down for fulfillment. They d certainly don't need to do any sortation. They have a fast path uh, down to the fulfillment stations and then the multi-line orders. All of these orders are merging into workstations and the system is watching which station, uh, if, it, if it's three stations are open, which station uh, you know, gets the next uh, 10, 15 orders uh, for the buffer that, for that particular station. Um, and it also determines whether it goes into bag or boxing. So Chris, maybe you can take us down the path a bit about how we make the decision on bag or boxing and some of our key learnings in that as we engineered the fulfillment stations. So when we started, uh, you know, it was start to understand the balance in the, uh, from an engineering side of how many things do go out by bag, how many things go out by box, what size. Uh, early on, we started to do a calculation, and REI had 29 different size boxes. And uh, as Rick did as a leader, he said, do we really need that? And we were able to get that down to three or four pre-built available through. 
in the uh, Manhattan in the warehouse management system. There were key flags and, uh, that marked if something could be shipped via a bag. There was a cubing that was done, and we knew that. And we early, uh, split an order to going to an automated bagging station where if it's a down vest, you grabbed it, dropped it in, put in your collateral, hit the button, and it was gone, and it was now off to shipping. It was going to end up on a UPS or FedEx truck or or for direct to a store for pickup at the store. Uh, that was all done and sorted that way. The boxing, we were able to give somebody a choice. We give them a recommended size box, but also provide them a choice of different size boxes that they can choose to grab an A, B, or C size pre-built. They put their product in that box and push it off. They don't need to scan, as Rudy pointed out. They're not scanning every item over and over again. They're able to do that on auto, a automated box closer, print and apply, does all the other uh, tedious work of packing a box, and it's put in and send direct to shipping also. So l let me just make sure that, that you understand these packaging stations, because um, we set out to fundamentally change the amount of labor that was in these stations. And you're standing there as a person, as Rudy said, you've got your three pockets. If you happen to be at a cardboard station, you have three sizes of boxes. These were automatically erected and automatically delivered to you via conveyor. If you pull one out, the conveyor delivers another one to that location. The screen gave you a recommendation, choose box A, B, or C. You could have ignored that. But the moment you pull out a box and you set it on your table, there's a barcode reader there and a license plate was on that box. So immediately that box, that license plate has been associated to the order of the three bags. Well, when the three bags arrived, the packing slip already started um, printing. All you have to do is pull the items out of the bag, put them in the box, put the packing slip over it, and push the box off. That's your entire training right there. When the box leaves, the box is automatically closed. The box automatically gets a shipping label on it after it does post-routing uh, logic. Bagging is the same thing, except we're using a bag. And what we've actually delivered to the individual is both a medium-sized bag and a large-sized bag. At the same station, they just twist left or they twist right. Again, they pull out of the pocket. They either put in the smaller bag or they put into the larger bag. The packing slip is ready to go. They put it in. It drops. It immediately feeds away. And so what we found was that our, our automation upstream directly impacted our labor requirements downstream without a scan, high accuracy, very fast production in, uh, in packaging. This, this blows away our packaging in our two existing buildings. Yeah, one of the uh, opportunities that came up is in the workstation Rick described where you have a medium and a large bagger serving the same feed, feeding line of orders is that in our, other, in our other facilities, we have a dedicated uh, medium bag line and a dedicated large bag line. Uh, and if you're having less product coming down that needed medium bags, you're jumping back and forth, you're trying to decide how to staff, uh, and this created a lot more agility for us. The other piece is that we'll run up to 50 stations in our Bedford facility in Pennsylvania, uh, and the f scale of this facility is similar uh, and is running up to 10. Uh, what is three of those being manual, uh, more manual in nature uh, during our peak season. So you understand the throughput of these stations because of eliminating the decision processes of assembling an order, uh, because of eliminating latency that's inherent with scanning. And it's a fraction of a second, but right, uh, you know, simple, uh, simple fractions of second compounded over the day, um, compounded across a number of people result in a lot of time back into the process. Now the only one I'm gonna I'm gonna say that uh, we're gonna be very clear. I hate the packing list. We're working really hard to get that to an electronic process because it's the more latent process that remains as we look at our value stream mapping. So it's not that it was overlooked. Uh, it's it's that we're, that's an ongoing development, and we'll we'll move forward uh, and uh, and enable the systems that way. What we'd like to do is afford some opportunity for q and I'm sure that uh, as a first pass, that's kind of drinking through the fire hose uh, about what's going on in this facility. Um, but I'll open up for Q&A and uh, bring the mic around to anyone that uh, has a question and a few gentlemen would help me out. Sorry, thank you. In your 
in your auto bagging, in the, the bagging line, do you, does the packer have to put the item in the bag with the packing list and then seal it? That's not automated. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a standard auto bag that you see in multiple versions here where you, you take the product out of the pocket, the bag has already had the label applied, the bag has already been opened, you slide it in, you grab the packing slip, you slide it in, it automatically seals, it's being taken away by auto conveyor. Hi, um, this is maybe industry specific, uh, so if you want to take this offline, that's fine too. Um, do you, does the pack pocket sorter handle any of your conveyable but bulkier items such as helmets and boots and things like that? And if not, do you have plans uh, to automate that in, in some way in the future? So relative to our industry, no, it doesn't do a kayak boat because I can't get it in the tote, but I, you know, you don't want it all caught up, but you would be shocked by how much actually can get into the sorter. You know, we didn't think shoes could go in there. Shoes go in there without a problem, right? So really, if the dimension of the product can fit into the tote of the OSR, at least two of them, it can go through the pocket sorter. Now, there are some weight issues and there's some, there's some challenges, right? Where if, uh, if you filled up the pocket sorter with all of your most heavy things at the exact same time, you would outweigh the system. But we know our randomness of it. We're not filling up the pocket sorter with all boots at the exact same time. That's just, it's not happening in any course of time. So we're pretty pleased with how much, if it's conveyable, fits in the OSR, it'll work in the pocket. Hey, you mentioned that REI has a lot of non-conveyable uh, items like boats and kayaks that don't lend themselves to automation. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you uh, design the storage and the uh, handling of these bulkier items to seamlessly integrate with the uh, automation. So um, pretty standard stuff. I mean, if it's... Uh, it, if it's car top boxes, if it's bikes, this is gonna go into standard racking. Um, if it's boats, we actually use an industry technique by which a boat can stand up and actually work through a grid mesh. Uh, the grid is 10 by 10, so you can have 100 boats all standing up. And then the way our process design works is, is that we time our orders out to the shipping dock. So if you've got non-conveyable that's coming through and conveyable, they come together. We don't isolate the order though. We don't try to go get a non-conveyable item and put it in a big box with some of the other things. Um, that actually, it production-wise is very problematic and we don't really get the efficiency in the shipping because of cubic dimensions, so, uh, so we don't even attempt to do that. Now, along these lines, what we didn't talk about relative to the pack groups and how the OSR produces the orders, we do time our release of stores. So we're very, because of the OSR and the goods to person station, we are able to say we want these five stores to ship by 9 p.m. And the system will, not, I shouldn't say 9 p.m., 9 a.m. The system will actually move all of its non-conveyables down while at the same time we're collecting the conveyables through the OSR system coming down at the same time. And we will ship those off the dock and then start working another grouping of later stores departing. Hi, thank you. I came a little late, so you might have already covered this, but do you utilize any kind of reusable packaging between your, um, you know, retailers and then the DC? So we actually covered that specific question in our sustainability um, presentation yesterday. So all of these cardboard boxes that are in the OSR and you're seeing release out to the stores, um, had you seen one of those boxes, you would have seen seven, eight, ten labels on the side of it. Because we actually bring the cardboard boxes back from the stores and inject them right back into the goods to person stations and reuse them over and over. Our mathematical analysis of how we're doing this is that uh, it was of lower cost to us than using a, a, a plastic uh, tote uh, going out to the stores and coming back to us. So we recycle the cardboard. 
any of the cardboard that goes to the end user customer, we would expect that their community does recyclable, and so uh, so they do that on their end. Yes, the cardboard boxes anywhere between 10 and 15 cycles start to break down, and then we send them through recycling. The lids, are, the lids and the boxes are recycled at the store. Thank you. What do you ship the boxes on to the store? On a pallet? Yes. Yeah, we're just standard pallets that go out to, uh, out to so LTL shipments to them. Those pallets themselves, we work a trade agreement with, uh, with our LTL carriers. And is that a wooden pallet? It's a wooden pallet trade agreement with LTL. So what we inject in, they're responsible for giving us back. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like a great system, right? So you guys can go back in time and change one thing about how you implemented or your processes, what would that be? We all agree on the same issue, and it's probably one when you look at, it's about the effect on the employees. It's in Goodyear's Arizona, the vistas are beautiful, we put an electric panel across the window that everybody can look out of. And it sits there. Uh, actually, some people have said in the, later in the afternoon, the sun comes in, and so they appreciate the blockage. But it was a great view that was at it. And we all laugh about it. So where these uh, eight stations are, they're up above on a mezzanine. And actually, those windows on the left-hand side, we built in all of these funky windows that you don't normally put in a pocket sorter. And the reason is because Rudy had me in Germany one day, and he's like, hey, look at these German warehouses. They have all these windows. It was really exciting. So we lined up all the goods-to-person stations there. And in all of our drawings, we missed the fact that we put a bunch of electrical equipment right in front of those windows. It still brings in great ambient light. We like it. But yes, that's the one that we would probably all get. Because if you were standing there, you would go, so windows and electrical equipment. But uh, if that's the worst that we've got, we're, we're pretty happy with what came out. There is only one termination. I get fired about every other day for that one. So. So you guys got to learn a lot building this plant and designing it from scratch, Greenfield. From all the stuff that you learned, what were you able to apply back to your existing buildings on the sort of the brownfield developments? Well, that's sort of the ongoing conversation right now. And, um, you know, how do we bring this back to our East Coast facility, Bedford, which is reaching capacity? And how do you integrate this technology into that? And, uh, you know, we're in those conversations right now. How do we, how do we add another 100,000 square feet on? How do we build this whole uh, technology into it? And then, you know, almost over weekend, try and uh, engage into this new process. And, um, you know, it's a little bit harder with our Sumner facility. It's a smaller facility now that's in Washington. Um, and how we bring that through these packaging designs, this idea of how fast we could get packaging is something that we're, uh, we're clearly looking at. Um, but this design all predicates on the idea of bringing the whole CANAP system into it. I would like to extend on that uh, a little bit. So what we learned at the very beginning, what REI's business is, and as a team we came to, together, we realized that there's various equipment out there, and uh, we drove a few points home during the design phase. You know, we had at, uh, at CNAP, we have the, the store fulfillment equipment, and then we had a separated pocket sorter direct to consumer fulfillment. So in the design phase, we learned, why don't we combine that? Now, as my friends lovely pointed out, we people in Germany and Austria be a little bit stubborn, but with, uh, you know, with a little bit patient, we actually got there and we, we learned during this process and came up with this unique uh, goods to person station what is serving both retail and direct to consumer. Yeah, I had one question. Yesterday in your talk, you talked about the fact that you had some collisions in your building construction between where members, steel members, ended up and where you wanted to place things. I was curious if you could talk about, did you guys use 3D BIM modeling of your facility? What other techniques did you use to prevent collisions, or did you, or would you do that differently? Chris, I got to look at you. You got this? Okay. You know, there were, we did 
uh, model it out and some of the things that I don't know if the, probably the biggest one was one that we didn't predict was there were some timing issues that came out in particular between the builder and the in the air conditioning unit where we wanted to locate it uh, the capability uh, to get it in had ended up relocating it so they were uh, what we hoped what they thought they could do and it was a partnership we kind of this was when we hit the challenge and said, oh, we can't get it through the door. We can't get it through the, this location. And you've built it, the hole you built it through, I, the only, I can't get it in anymore. It was sort of the key of this partnership between the, that we covered each other. We're like, okay, we can figure out a way around that problem. But it was one that modeling was not going to uh, eliminate or catch. It was a timing issue and an issue that came out. And so we did that. So there are other things that you realize um, when you're starting up this kind of an automated facility is that um, the design requirements say one thing, but the opening condition says another. And so let me give you an example. When everything you're receiving needs to go into the OSR and everything you put into the OSR also needs to get out, you actually find that you're maxing some of the capabilities of the system, but it's a startup condition. It's not an operating condition. And uh, so what I would say is, is that part of our learning and part of our, our greatest challenges was, are we seeing a system, a process, a people thing, or are we seeing a startup condition? And we, of course, were learning through those as we, uh, as we ramped in. So I'm just going to give you a geeky technical uh, response to part of that. One of, one of the big learnings was, each, each one of our partners dealt with annotations against the drawings a little bit differently. Uh, and that's a key learning for me, establishing a discipline around how change, or manage, uh, change management or change orders are happening on your drawings so that everyone's reading them uh, correctly. You won't have footings in the wrong place. <laughs> so, Bill, I think we're out of time. Yep. So, uh, certainly, we'll be around here for the next few minutes if anyone wants to ask us questions. As we have indicated before, this is an open source facility, primarily based on the idea of sustainability. But that means that you are allowed to come to this facility and experience it, tour it. Uh, we love to teach what it is that we have learned, and we also love to learn from others that come in and uh, challenge us about how we think about the future. So thank you for your time.